everyone. You're watching We Heart Therapy, the special series EFT Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Annabelle Bugatti, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified EFT supervisor and therapist here in fabulous Las Vegas. Vegas. Yay. We're well, you do doing therapy in Vegas stays in Vegas. Sorry. That's right? <laughs> and we are welcoming back to the show one of our favorite trainers is Jim Thomas. He is an internationally certified EFT trainer, supervisor, and therapist. He is the director of the Colorado Center for EFT. He also is an AAMFT supervisor, and he has a thriving practice in Colorado that really focuses on couples intensives, which is pretty exciting. So, and we've done a couple really wonderful episodes. And you know, Jim has a, a really good expertise on addictions and agency settings. So make sure you check out our other videos. But today we're gonna talk about de-escalation and understanding the markers for de-escalation is it can, it, it's kind of a gray area. So mm -hmm. just gonna help us try to shine the light on that. So thank you again, Jim, for being back with us. Oh, thank, thanks for having me, Annabelle, and thanks. Welcome folks who've come back for another listen or new listeners. I just really appreciate these resources and I often, um, just in Boston, I was sending people to the conversation you had with Ryan um, Reina, um, saying, hey, this, there's some good stuff here. So I think this, it's like a library of good talks, resource yeah. talks for, for any therapist. I think even if you're not, don't know EFT, if you just mm -hmm. value sort of human connection, vulnerability, and therapy approaches that help us engage our emotional experience rather than just sort of clip it and manage it or think about it, then these are, they, there's a lot of these videos to go back and watch. Thank you so much, Jim. And, and I like how you mentioned that. I think that's part of where the gray area with de-escalation happens is we're trying to clip pieces and compartmentalize, but it runs everywhere. And there's, it's just messy sometimes. Yeah. And so with all the messiness of couples therapy, how do we really know if our couple is ready for stage two? Does that mean that they never fight, that they don't get stuck in the cycle? What are we looking at here? Yeah, boy, never fight. You know, my, my, my wife, my life partner, Patrice and I, we in the old nomenclature have a, what we used to call like an earned secure attachment, you know, we, and um, we still have a cycle and we still have arguments. And I, I love that Sue said, you know, the first time I saw her talk in like 1998, she said every every couple, every, you know, family dyad, and any person of real importance in your life, there is probably a negative cycle present. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, you know, we know the difference between sort of an acquaintance and a real friend is we've had a negative cycle with a friend. Mm -hmm. We worked through something. We had an outburst. Because what is a negative cycle, right? It's, it is um, when my triggers, my behaviors are triggering you, your behaviors are triggering me mm -hmm. and we're both dysregulated. Yeah. And, and the absence of a sort of negative cycle or a demon dialogue like can hold me tight would be we're co-regulating each other. Mm -hmm. That you're sending a cue to me and I'm sending a cue to you that's calming or soothing or interesting, you know, something other than, ouch, uh-oh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's how, on the inside, right, we're all like sort of five years old. Right. right. When we're all on the comes inside. over, it's, it's pretty simple. So I say this to say, I think it's important to go back to the beginning and remember that, 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 um, oh, my, my wife is so wise. After we were doing a workshop, I did a workshop on effective beginnings um, back three, four years ago. Um, and it was a delightful workshop. We even had a couple come in and talk about, and they kind of talked about what de-escalation was like for them and, and how they knew they were ready to do stage two work. And Patrice got up after helping us all and taking care of us and doing process. And she said, I have to tell you, maybe you should stop calling it negative mm -hmm. because the, the, the existence of a cycle means you matter, mm -hmm. which is like what Allison Lee says. She mm -hmm. says to couples, you know, in her British accent, uh, I tell, she said to me once, I tell my couples, Jim, that do you know how to get into a negative cycle? All you need to do is matter to someone and let them matter to you. 
Oh. Uh, see, that just soothes it right, right away. Boom. So what is de-escalation of the cycle if we go into like technical terms? I think it's the one thing I want to make sure that people understand that are learning EFT, applying EFT. Sometimes we shorthand this, right? Mm -hmm. Has the couple de-escalated? And we forget de-escalation of this dysregulating you know, cycle that happens when they feel distant from each other, they don't feel safe with each other. Why, why would I, as a trainer, want to emphasize de-escalation of the cycle? The reason I think is because a good, you know, a therapist who's gonna come in and use like the first four steps and use the FT tango, right? That's gonna come in and say, I see you guys are like a hot mess as a couple or a family, or as an individual, you're describing that you know, you're in a cycle with somebody important that's not coming to session. And I'm gonna reflect this present moment process I see in front of me and start slowing you guys down. Then I'm gonna to go to move two and try to go inside one of your experiences and find out what's it like when you're in this loop, what's it like inside you based on what's in between you. I'm gonna to try to find something new, vulnerable, different. Have you share it with your partner? Move four, process that. Move five, integrate, and repeat, right? If you do that, what will happen, Annabelle, to a highly reactive couple in session? In session. They'll start to soothe. They'll de-escalate in session. Mm -hmm. I think one of, the, one of the most common mistakes, and I used to do this, I would think, oh my gosh, you guys are so much like more calm in session. You've probably de-escalated your cycle. <laughs> Right? No, we're calm because we're sitting with you, Annabelle. Right. You're helping slow us down, and you, you're walking us through this. You're tuning to us. You're, you know, right. you, you're focusing your cycle. The session that they don't really know how to create at home yet. And sometimes they stop doing their moves um, in order to diffuse the cycle, but they're not necessarily doing new moves to reshape the cycle. That's a wonder. That's a second one to watch for is like, so I say to you and your partner, so, hey, it's our seventh session together. Have you had any outbursts of your cycle recently? And you say, no. Your partner says, no. Then I have to ask, are you talking to each other? Are you interacting with each other? Because right. one way to avoid your cycle, right? Is not talk about it. And just, you know, it's the old, I'll really date myself. Sorry, millennials. Um, <laughs> it's the old karate kid line where Mr. Miyagi says, to the young man, you know, the best way to avoid a punch is don't be there. Yeah. Right, right. Um, Which can so, so uh, let's avoid our negative cycle by just not. Look, yeah. Avoid all triggery conversations. Avoid right. Any Which means you'd probably be absent for a large portion of the relationship interactions. So that's well, not we learn. We learn to put on like yeah. a. You know a. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm learning enough in EFT to know that if I raise my voice, it triggers my partner. I'm learning that if I, you know, go fishing too often, it's going to trigger my partner. So I decide not to go fishing. You're not raising your voice, but we're not really connecting. So one is, let's not confuse a de-escalation in session with this first yes. Change event of de escalation of this negative cycle or this cycle or this dysregulating thing that's dominating the relationship. Yeah. And then, two, if, you're, if we want to find out if they're still having a cycle outside a session, we have to be a little clearer and ask them things, right? Um, are like, you interacting differently? Or... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, let me see if, if I've captured all this correctly. So, first, I love that you say that we get all humans get into a cycle it's just you know part of it's because we're all looking for signs of acceptance love belonging security. yeah belonging from other human beings whether it's you know a friend relationship a family member a romantic partner our boss mm -hmm. you know it's like we're never not in relationship with other human beings and we're constantly looking for those signs and that's what attachment theory teaches us and i love how you say you know, a way to kind of talk about the cycle with couples is to say the easiest way to get into a cycle is because you matter. I think that's a great way of putting it 
to couples so that they're they're not so afraid of it. They're not like, oh, this is so terrible. And yeah, there's I, something yucky or bad about us because we have yeah. one. Yeah, and I try to make it clear to couples that no therapist can ever stop any of you from ever having a fight. It's just not humanly possible, right? We all get into disconnection and you know it's it's kind of like going to the doctor for a cold and he gives you antibiotics and thinking great i'm never gonna be sick again right that just doesn't happen right good luck with that right <laughs> right and i think that's what some couples sort of expect and maybe some therapists expect is that when when we're moving to stage two they're no longer getting into the cycle and they may miss some of the, the cues that they're not necessarily de-escalated, like maybe they're not fighting, but, in, but maybe the hostile pursuer just isn't saying anything now. They're, yeah, not they're burning out or they're shutting down or they're avoiding or channeling yeah. their inner withdrawal. Yeah. I got this. Yeah. <laughs> Let's learn how to down-regulate like our partner does. Or the... Yeah. Yeah. So they're doing that and they're still not getting their needs or their concerns heard by their partner. And so when you get through deeper step in stage two, you may find that they completely re-escalate and you slide backwards. And it's, you know, that's what it can feel like. Because we right, know right. Well, let's go to this, like, signs of de-escalation. Like, what does it really mean? And, you know, Sue talks about it. It's a, in systems theory, it's like a first order change. It's, um, it's like, you know, rearranging who's in who's vice president of operations in the business, you know, rather than a real restructuring of how we do business. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's, and I think Sue herself, I think she it's in Hold Me Tight where she describes um, that when she was working on her dissertation and she was doing couples therapy, that uh, often the couple would start to learn about their cycle, look a little better and leave, and then come back like three, four or five months later and say, it didn't hold. And that's where she really got so much of her wisdom about the deeper work, you know. And if we think about what we're doing, well, what are we doing in stage one work or stabilization, as Sue calls it in her new brilliant book, Attachment Theory and Practice, um, a must read. It's a great book. Um, she, she said she started starting to play with that, you know, how we think about the, early, the stage one, phase one work is we're trying to stabilize this relationship enough to do the deeper work, which brings me to like surgery metaphors and stuff. You know, you need open heart surgery, but you're really out of shape. We have to stabilize you before we can open your heart up. So what are those, those first four steps in the model, you know, alliance and attunement, like what's happening here? How is it to be with me in session? How is it to be with each other? The second step is this focus on a cycle that we're talking about today. And then we're. Can we kind of stop there just yeah. real quick? I want to dig into alliance and, you know, step one. And I've heard different trainers say different things. And I think that's something I like that Catherine Ream says is there's multiple right ways <laughs> to do oh, something. Better to find multiple right ways. Catherine's so wise. And I kind of use the. So I've heard. I'm thinking of assessment, that I use assessment as part of the alliance building. And I know some trainers will say, well, I just split the couple up and I do two 30 minute sessions. But if I've got clients that have mass amounts of trauma, there's going to be big things that I'm not possibly going to be able to capture in 20 minutes, especially because to get those kinds of details is a little bit of a deep dive. And I kind of feel like you have to have a little emotional foreplay first. <laughs> like, let's start a little at the top. And, you know, and I always ask. Sure, it's a, it's a, an example of that is when you ask people about like their family growing up and in the first, second session, they say everything was fine. Yes. In the eighth session, they might say, well, it's complicated. And in the 15th session, they're crying about their dad was never there for them. Yeah. And That's you're like, what you're talking about, right? You're not going to get everything by asking. Right. Right. Yeah. right. So I, I do a full session for my, and I include that as my step one. I do a full individual session with each person for assessment. And I always start off with where are you from, which A, tells me what their cultural background might be like or what other things they need to ask about culture. But I feel like it, it builds this alliance as it's a more natural conversation. I'm kind of setting the tone for the rest of therapy that I'm talking to you like a human being, not like, you know, you're on a job interview or. <laughs> I like you know. that. I and mean, yeah, I'm, I'm more, if you saw my office, this is my inner, where my desk is and stuff and over there is, um, 
a therapy office with the window looking outside and I have like wood paneling and it looks like you come into my living room. Nice. Um, and it's, that is what the, the message I'm trying to send to the limbic system is, you know, yeah. me casa su casa. Yeah. This is a place you can, we can have like a park bench conversation about this relationship. Right. You know, I'm not sitting clinically in my white robe, you know. Right. My and even though I am, I'm taking a lot of notes in the assessment session, but I'm yeah, I take to- notes, but I mean, I mean, metaphorically, like I'm not sitting yeah. behind my, and have you had, hen- you know, and how many times and when did uh, you? Yeah. What I end up doing is kind of getting my step four seeds during the assessment, during oh, the assessment yeah, yeah. where I'm like understanding what are their attachment needs, what were the attachment traumas that they had growing up, what did they need most, what did they not get, and and I noticed that if I do a really thorough attachment assessment and I start connecting dots for them, that I found that that actually helps with de-escalation because clients oh, are starting. Sure see things they didn't see and they're like oh okay and they come out of the assessment session saying wow like I just learned things I didn't know and it seems so much more clear as to how that affects my partner and then it kind of sets the table for the beginning of our cycle work I like that yeah and especially if we don't go sort of swamp them with psychoed about it and say now that you've had this brief insight into how these relationships might be impacting you, you'll stop shutting down now, right? You know, like. <laughs> right, right, no. Using no. it, I like the way you said it, you're like planting. Yeah. We're waking up maybe, waking up yeah. the attachment system for the withdrawer mm-hmm. and helping organize and soothe the attachment system for a more anxious pursuer, right? Like. And yeah, and the pursuer, you know, where the thing you needed the most was acceptance and that's right. the thing you never got. And then I'm able to, what was your, you had a question about assessment and alliance. I want to make sure I didn't miss oh, it. Oh, just what, what was your take on it? Because I know Sue says you, you really only need to get enough information to help change the cycle. But, you know, with the whole there's multiple right ways, I mean, is it okay to use the assessment as part of the alliance building? Well, here, can I answer it in a little different way? Sure. I think, I believe, my belief um is it's always you're either always strengthening alliance um you have a rupture that you're either aware of or you're not and you're repairing or you're taking points away from the alliance and this is just life because we have cycles with our clients too and we are all like we have strengths and weaknesses and we i can really resonate with this and i might be missing that so how we approach attachment history, how we approach assessment, how we approach that first phone call. I mean, before I got on, I was on, a, somebody called me about doing an intensive and, you know, in a 20 minute phone call, I got to a place where the fellow got off the phone and said, whoa, you're really, wow, a male pursuer, wow. I hadn't thought of it that way. A lot of things are going click, click, click in my brain. I'm looking forward to talking to my partner about this possibility of coming to see you right I'm all I'm building alliance I learned this years ago I, I worked at Denver Children's Home and and, and um, my boss said um, if you're in a therapeutic relationship with somebody like one of the teenagers or their parents or something every interaction is part of your therapy mm-hmm. you know you cannot not do you cannot not communicate as the old communication theorist said so I absolutely agree with you I think we're weaving I'm a, yeah, I think of it weaving so yeah. there is essential information i need to get like is there ongoing domestic violence that fits in like in intimate parent partner terrorism is there an ongoing addiction that, that, that's going to create hostility and stuff and we can't be safe is there an ongoing affair but even i asked that I, I think a brilliant one i learned long ago was um i'm a pretty um, i'm pretty i don't know what we would call it like like I said, I have a living room to come work in and stuff. And I would get couples that would say, we've been thinking about it. We'd like your wife and you to come over for dinner. And I learned to say, wow, that would be lovely. I would love to see your house and eat this food you've talked about and meet your kids and stuff. I have these professional boundaries that don't allow me to do that. Instead of saying, oh, I have these professional boundaries. Yeah. You know what? Lead with the heart. One and doubtly with the heart. So let me let me go. So yeah, alliance and assessment. I think it was ongoing. I mean, we're still assessing as we go into stage two. We're still assess. I'm assessing. 
-hmm. When you make your reach as a withdrawer and then you make another reach, I'm, I'm wondering if there's deeper reaches to go. Do you, can we get to more of your attachment longings and fears before we leave this session if I have time? I'm assessing about whether you de-escalated or not. And I'm attuning to you guys in that, in that attunement, getting more and more, um, getting more and more um, information each time I attune. Yes, and then I want to start exploring a cycle on all levels. Like, a, I think I heard like Lisa Palmer Olson say this for the first time, you know, all levels, which is, you know, what is a cycle? It's two people's emotional experiences. That's right. Regulating each other, right? And yes. then what is step three? You know, we validate the secondary, what's on the surface, and we're trying to access what's below the surface in that cycle. Mm -hmm. And then help them, each partner, look at like, oh, this wookie feeling in my stomach, I start to get scared in my chest and I start feeling like shame in my stomach. And so I run away, mm -hmm. but on the outside I look shut down. I'm starting to make sense of where my shutdown comes from you're starting to make sense of maybe where your anger comes from. So we're helping people make sense of this cycle that we want them to deescalate of their part in the cycle. I think another user error is we rush in too quick to want them to understand their partner side. Yes. Let that happen more naturally. That's a sign of deescalation actually is you'll start seeing a little more curiosity, sustained curiosity, I call it. And so ownership of their part in the cycle curiosity about their partner's part and i think also you said something very important sometimes we go too fast i think over that step two over or over validating the secondary reactive emotions and i think kind of the old way of eft was just hurry up and get to the primary emotions that we almost bypass people's secondary and yet we wonder why we can't break through that barrier so if we bypass secondary and don't, and we're not accessing primary, then we absolutely have not spent enough time making sense of being in, 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 in the accepting, like being curious, accepting, focused, and empathic about um, the secondary. We also can make a corollary mistake where we stay in secondary too long and don't mm -hmm. move towards the openings. Mm -hmm. so if a couple just stays up and like, yes, thank you for helping make, make an understand why I'm so shut down, help me understand why I'm so angry, and I don't access something vulnerable, they lose mm -hmm. momentum too. So this is part of the art, right? So let me go back through it this way. Like, so assessment alliance is ongoing, and that already starts to de-escalate maybe their cycle because they start to connect with me or you. Each of the partners and the relationship starting to get soothing and feel a safe you know, haven, secure base for the relationship and their experience with the therapist. It's that Mr. Rogers, you know, kind of, I understand it's very difficult to be in therapy, right? I get it. You have a cycle. I get it. And you do have a cycle. Let's start exploring it and let's find the heart. What's going on? What's being, what's in below the surface that doesn't, you don't show in the cycle, but it's fueling your actions. Let's decriminalize your tendencies as uh, I think Michael Burnett, maybe Gail Palmer like to say, where you, you're able to start decriminalizing your tendency. Then as we deepen that emotional experience, we start to feel a shift. This is one of the first signs I'm farther along in stage one and getting closer to stage two is the attachment longing and the attachment frame and the attachment pain start surfacing more as a result of this repeated visiting, right? Using the tango to keep visiting. What's it like to be here in this therapy? What's, how's it going? How are, where are you getting triggered? What are you, what's happening outside of here? Are you remembering any of these vulnerable moments outside of here? Are you able to share them? You don't, help me understand why. Let's linger longer, move to that Tango, let's linger longer. I, I wrote this article, you're, you know, lean in and linger, don't press. It's a nice a new letter. I called press premature resonant, resonance expectation syndrome, silly. <laughs> we want the partners to start taking care of each other and accepting their partner's experience in stage one. Well, step six, promoting partner acceptance of this new expression is in stage two. That's right. Let, but a sign of de-escalation will be you start getting some sustained curiosity 
where I can sit with my partner as she's opening up to you as therapist and saying, yeah, I'm mad on the outside, but I'm really hurting and scared on the inside. And then and she talking with you about it. I'm not going in there going, what? Burr, burr. I'm like, well, that's interesting. Now, you may have her turn to me, step three in the tango, move three in the tango and say, hey, honey, I look mad on the outside, but I'm actually sad and scared on the inside. And I can't soothe her, mm -hmm. but I don't shut her down. Mm -hmm. I'm curious. It's, it's new. And it's mm -hmm. a sign that maybe we're starting to deescalate. We're getting closer to that. You'll see also another big sign of, so I think about it, there's external signs, internal and internal signs, and there's signs in the session and within ourselves. Mm -hmm. Another thing you'll start seeing is like, as a result of this, as we go deeper into the attachment meaning, and withdrawers and pursuers start accessing these powerful primary emotions and sitting with you in, in, this, in move two or step three of the model, and you're, you're not trying to take away their experience, you're being in their experience with them, a beautiful thing starts to happen. Anxious pursuers start to unpack their sort of Play-Doh ball of like, I got, I'm mad and I'm sad and I'm hurt and I'm scared and I've got shame. They get to start unpacking that and organizing in a different way that helps them make sense of what they're doing. And withdrawers, attachment systems wake up and they start coming forward with, I'm sad too. I'm not just sad that you're sad. I'm sad. I'm lonely too. I had a wonderful live in Denver a few years ago with this female withdrawer and this male pursuer. And I worked with her for a while and I worked with him for a while. And actually, I did something different with anger than you were talking about. I just, I just said to him, I understand you get really pissed and you like to do this, this, and this, and you have good reason because she's so shut down and hard to reach. Am I right? Would you like to share your anger with me now? And he goes, no, you got it. Yeah. And he was, we're getting towards the end of this live and we're asking for feedback. A lot of people have been to externships, you know, get feedback from the therapist. And the woman says, as they go to get feedback, before they come in with the feedback, you need to know all this emotion that's stirred up in me today, it's because I need this too. I miss you. I've been lonely like this since I was a little girl. Mm -hmm. And now you start to see, you'll see these signs from the withdrawer with they're starting to sit in their own attachment longings, their own attachment emotions, not just how can I take care of my pursuer so they're not mad at me. And that's one of the biggest signs because now there's a good chance you want to take that withdrawer deeper into that step five work or you want to take them deeper and move to and you'll start seeing that ownership of emotions, ownership of previously disowned parts, an immersion in those emotions. And, and often for those withdrawers, this is actually relief to get to this stage, right? So that's, an, that's a sign of like, so, so one of the external signs of that is you'll start seeing the withdrawer and hopefully the pursuer too, using more we, us, this is our cycle, this is our struggle, this is what happens to us when we don't feel safe or connected. This is what happens when we do. And then in session, when this is happening, so we've gone through step one, two, three, and four with them numerous times. We've gone through the tango numerous times. In session, we start seeing more emotional, like, you know what I mean? More emotional space in the session. There's, there's less rigidity and more space. Like, there's, like the whole room is breathing deeper. And they can sit in something like hurt they can sit in sadness, they can sit in lonely and scared for a little bit without immediately escalating, but it's, they still have a cycle. Right, right. So I love what you're saying about how even like your withdrawers will start to talk about their own feelings, not just how do I get my pursuing partner to not be so upset. And sharing and engaging those feelings. Right, right. So you're, but what I also hear you saying is that just because we move to stage two or when they're ready for stage two doesn't necessarily mean that they're not ever having a cycle. Right. Well, one sign, a classic sign, I remember Sue saying in like 1998, the first time I saw her talk, I, saw, I, have, I found my notes. It's like, she said, sign of de-escalation. They have done something differently with their cycle outside of session. So I mean, what you often hear is something like, 
we stopped it. I said, I love you to her. She said, well, I, be, I guess you do, but I don't know. And then I said, could we get out of our cycle and wait till we see Annabelle? You know, they do something different with their cycle. That right. is a great external sign of what you just were talking about. And just, does that just happen one time though, or do we need to see a little bit of consistency in maybe they've had three or four sessions where they've continually been This is a great to question. And I'm, I'm guessing when you like, you know, there's more than one right way, et cetera, that you get different answers. Let me piggyback off of that because part of it is we'll see these external signs. We'll see signs and external signs. So like outside of session, something's different. They're reporting different things at home. Um, in session, there's a lot more space in the room. The cycle may come into the room, but you can slow them down much faster. They can sort of zoom out and look at we're in our cycle or, or it's easier to zoom one of them into their side of the dance. Um, they start making little reaches for each other. You know, they maybe are, they start holding hands while they're talking about the cycle. Um, and then in us, we'll feel something different, I think. We feel a sort of a, something's happening here. And we'll often see signs of, that would be similar to like secure attachment with us mm -hmm. from the partners. Um, and, the, and their relationship, a sort of like, we're relieved to be here, you're helping us understand this deeper. Um, another way to think about it, what you're talking about and whether or not to go deeper is to, to look at each of the five moves in the tango. When they're de-escalating that cycle, they're stabilizing as Sue describes it in the new book. They're perhaps moving into a, a feeling of safe and security with you. And they're maybe really kind of visiting secure attachment land with each other once in a while. You might even have little bonding moments that don't hold, right? Like post it glue in session. What, do we, what we're reflecting in that present moment process starts to take on a different quality. It's almost like instead of, we're starting to reflect not just black and white sort of film or sepia tones, there's more color that we're reflecting back. There's newer, more nuance our sense of them as we reflect back and the ability to, 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 for our mirror neurons to join with them, they, they become as, like Jim Cohen might say, our brain's friend. Mm -hmm. And I get what you're saying at a deeper level. When I go towards you in move two, you, you come with me sooner. You go deeper. It still may be I have these feelings because of my partner and because of you know, the cycle but I go deeper into those feelings. Another big misnomer I think can happen is that deep feelings only happen in stage two. Yeah. It's the quality of the emotional experience. That's right. Deeper, deeper experiencing, but without the ownership, I'm not, I'm, I might be flooded by it or I clip it really quick. Then when I say to you, can we take what we found in move two and share it in move three, choreograph an encounter with your partner, you'll see more, less of this kind of phenomenon where earlier in stage one, I have Jim down in a kind of an emotional experience. And when Jim goes to share it, he clips it or he goes off tangent or he gets mad instead of sad. And you'll see more congruence between what I just shared with you and what I share with my partner. Right, I think what, and I've heard, um, I think George Fowler said this, that the content of the enactment should be view of self. So I'm imagining when you're saying this that that there's more congruence that when you ask them to share that their the content of their share, the direction of their share is going to be view of self to share with the other versus I'm turning and again blaming you or coping. Yeah, but by this time you're not seeing much of that unless it's a painful thing where maybe for this first time I'm saying, you know, Annabelle, this is really hard for me because I do get mad at you. I do get mad at you because it really hurt what you said five years ago. It really hurt. And we keep dismissing it. We've been to three therapists and what you said to me was terrible. I'm scared to tell you, you know, we're getting, you can feel it like this is starting, oh, this is interesting. This sounds like stage two, but I'm still kind of, you know, I'm struggling. And I would say to me, um, view of self and view of other, I am, 
those are, oh, I'm only dealing with those as things to change in stage two. In right. stage one, they're just openings into primary experience. They're right. I'm not trying to challenge them. So let me finish the tango thing real quick. So like, okay. just, um, so then we also then see when we go to process, we see more of that curiosity and stuff from the partner. They're, they may be wrestling with it. They're going, I, I've never heard this before. Well, yeah, because this person never visited this before, you know, and I get that you don't, right? And we, we start, they start saying like, wow, we did something different today. If I'm getting all that, but if I'm seeing a qualitative change in the tango, I feel like I've been through those steps. They've walked through those steps a number of times. And I, I'm then starting to look generally for signs from whoever is the most emotionally withdrawn that they're, that I, I could take them into step five and then do the tango in stage two. I'm, I'm personally, my, my experience, and I've been doing EFT for a long time, I've been doing attachment-based stuff for a long time. If people are warmed up and ready, I like that get to softenings that Sue said to me once. You know, If we stay in the borderline, where we've de-escalated our cycle, but you don't take me deeper, what's gonna happen at home? Re-escalate. Yeah, the withdrawer starts feeling like I'm been opening up and making changes and I don't get any credit. The pursuer's waiting for the withdrawer to show up and be emotionally supportive and present and it's not happening. They de reescalate. And I think this is part of then a missed opportunity maybe to close our conversation, which is we do have some enough de-escalation, a qualitative real change we see in the tango moves, we, we feel in their ownership. You know, they're tying these primary vulnerable emotions that they're sharing with us and experiencing with us into what causes them to do what they do, their action tendency, the emotional meaning, the attachment meaning is surfacing from their bottom up. And we keep them in this sort of fuzzy limbo and they reescalate. And then the therapist thinks it's the problem is with the model. Okay. You're right. going to have to be brave. Perfect. When Perfect. you take people down in there, whatever time you do it, we still have yeah. to be brave. And something important you said, you know, about, oh, we think that because we're doing deep work that it must be stage two or that the couple is ready for stage two. And I see that a lot where a, a therapist will be, oh, we're going really deep. But I think for couples that are highly escalated and live in reactivity for a lot of their marriage and, and aren't really vulnerable and emotionally intimate with each other, that primary emotion is going to be really deep for those kinds of couples. And so, for anybody. I go, I go into pie. It's evoke and yeah. prime evoke and explore primary emotion is step three. It's not talk about it, swim on the surface of it. Right. I remember once Sue said, I'm heightening and deepening emotion in stage one. The one that she told me, I don't once attachment longings and fears are coming from the bottom up. She's not going to heighten those in stage one because she wants to hold that back for the bonding event work. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's what we do with the emotion. Yeah. To help escalate. Yes. Like, you know, the direction of stage one versus stage two is different. Like stage one, even though you may be going deep, the direction of it is towards how do we get out of disconnection or how do I invite you into a different space when we feel disconnected versus stage two is now how do I bond? Now that, now that we know how to get out of disconnection and deal with conflict, now how do I bond? How do I go deeper? That's interesting. I would have to think about that. I might just, I, um, I would, so I would describe it as we're accessing these primary emotions, we're validating secondary and organizing that, accepting, then accessing these vulnerable emotions of of hurt and pain, you know, of sadness and lonely, but the distance, fears that come up through, you know, these catastrophic conclusions and attributions that represent working models, but I'm not trying to change working models right. so that I can make sense of my action tendency and right. you can make sense of yours. And in that safety, as Annabelle slows us down, I, through my emotional experience, start to feel from the bottom up oh my gosh, we're in this cycle because you mean so much to me. 
the threat of you saying I'm not enough means so much to me that I go through this dance and I don't know how to say to you, I just would like to know that I'm enough, that I'm the right person for you, that I'm still good enough, even though I had that affair, or even though I did those drugs and drove you crazy for six years, or even though I focused on work or the kids and vice versa, that I'm starting to access that emotional experience and that helps us de-escalate. I don't expect them to be able to deal with conflict in stage one or problem solve or anything. That's step eight, you know, new solutions to old problems. Ah. Step nine, new narrative. That's right. what's happening because they've moved into secure attachment. Right. Now they right. can resolve those things, right? But it does seem like a clear focus of stage one, you know, as it's so aptly called is cycle, you know, de-escalation. So we're focusing on the de-escalation versus bonding and you need that scaffolding to build that safety. You need yes. to withdraw, yes. to build, to be able to start accessing and feeling emotions that they weren't yeah. able to do. Cause if they can't do that, they're not going to be able to deep dive in stage two. Yep. In stage two, we're like, okay, what do you need to feel? like a lovable human being and how do you turn to your spouse and get that? How do you tune into those needs and how do you use your partner as a resource to do that and build intimacy and bonding together? Yeah, that's a stage two discussion, right? Like, look, so, cause I, I have a whole, like, yeah. The, but what you said is very interesting. I would suggest to therapists using EFT to look at de-escalation of the cycle or stabilization as a dependent variable. We're looking for we, we're looking for that cycle to, to not run the show all the time so there's enough safety. And then the independent variables we're working with is them, each partner starting to understand like, what is this cycle I get into and my emotional experience of that and my actions to start accessing and exploring and spending time in those primary emotions and to start feeling the attachment meaning of all that, that those are the independent variables that result in the cycle de-escalating um versus me saying now that you guys know this what are you going to do to de-escalate your cycle which i think um starts moving us more towards it, the risk is you're moving towards like problem solving or more like build a safe house or mm -hmm. can you see that when you get angry you trigger your wife can you see yeah. that when you shut down you trigger your partner yeah so de-escalation let's be clear i'm going to summarize for myself Perfect. Let's be clear that we're de-escalating up. This. We're, we're working to see signs that they've de-escalated their negative loop, pattern, demon dialogue, whatever they're calling it, or we're calling it cycle. And, and they're, um, they're, versus they're just de-escalated in session because you're providing structure and support and empathy. Mm -hmm. We look for external signs, which are things like more use of we and us. We see them starting to talk about the problem as being related to distance, the solution to some kind of closeness or being on the same team. Um, we see maybe some evidence that they're doing something different with their cycle at home or they're talking about it different with us. They can zoom out more and zoom in. In session, we start seeing signs of more space in the room, more flexibility. Um, the cycle will still come and go. But what I say to couples often towards the end of stage one, it's like, oh, your cycle spent a bunch of time in the waiting room. And now it's back. Like there's less time of um, in the cycle and just having to like deal with that reactivity or open up the withdrawn, withdrawn couple. And then in us, we'll feel a stronger ability to just kind of get them and relate to them and empathize with them and slow them down. And our, our dance with them will be soothed, smoother. If we're looking at it through the five moves, you know, move one, present moment process, they're not ready for de-escalation. We're still probably reflecting a lot of escalation and reactivity. It's tough when we go in, move two to open up the, the, what's going on inside. We're getting a lot of, I feel this way, but it's because of. Yeah. It's okay, we have to go there, right? Mm -hmm. Our enactments are clunkier. The partner doesn't really get it. It, and the enactments may be served to help this person go deeper into their emotion rather than get a better response. Um, and there's the tying of the bow is more things like, look at you guys, you're doing something different versus the tying of the bow where they're looking at each other in stage two and they've had a bonding event. And the tying of the bow is, wow, look at you guys, you just had a bonding event. So that would be in summary what I was hoping I would go. Yeah, that's beautiful. 
On that note too, a last question I have is I hear a lot of therapists getting stuck on, well, we've been in stage one for 10 to 12 sessions and Susan should be able to do EFT in 10 to 12 sessions. Does that mean we should move on? And they could have a double trauma couple, you know? So how do we get therapists to not hang on to that? I mean, those were like master clinicians with couples that probably had a more positive ratio to negative to begin with you know, but highly escalated. Well, I'm going up to Bozeman, Montana. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're just finalizing all this, so, but I'm pretty sure this is going to happen. We're, I'm going to go to Bozeman May 1st and 2nd, and we're going to talk about working with high reactivity um, within, without, and in between. So that we're also talking about like us and our sort of expectations that things ought to move at a certain pace. Right. The other thing I would say about that is, Borrow those four P's of EFT as you do your tango work. Like, what's happening in the present moment? How, how much primary emotion are these people accessing and sitting in for a while? Are we getting loss in content instead of bringing it to process? Are we getting frustrated with their position and their pattern instead of going deeper into that? Where did this position come from? Um, and, and, look, and borrow from the old 12-steppers about progress over perfection. Are they getting a bit more vulnerable? Are they sharing a little deeper level? Are they making more sense of their cycle? Is the attachment meaning starting to surface? And forget 10 to 12 sessions. Yeah. Worry less about the number and more about the work. Yeah, well, then maybe that's another discussion we can have. That's, Absolutely. That's a tough one. Well, it's a hook for all of us. We want to perform. We want to do well. We start feeling bad that it's taking too long, whatever, you know. Or the couple starts yelling, wow, we're getting our cycle, but we need tools. Yes, yes. Probably not to escalate I got poked yesterday by a traumatized pursuer who said, you know, we just need more. You need to tell us what to do. Like, here's what's wrong. Here's how to fix it. And I said, you've read a thousand self-help books. If you didn't get it from that, <laughs> yeah, you okay. get it. I love that. Good answer. Always <laughs> a delight talking with you. <laughs> and thank you so much, Jim. Now tell everyone, so we're going to be starting a supervision group for advanced EFTers um, coming in 2020. So guys, look for information on that. Jim's going to be so wonderful and host a supervision group for EFTers. But tell everyone your website, where can they find you? How can they book you? For yeah, training? you can, um, for trainings, um, one of the easiest things, go to jimthomas.care. And then there's a Jim's training button. Um, I have coming up. I'm, I'm going to be in Edmonton, and I think that's sold out maybe, but there may be a few openings in November. I am doing, um, if you're watching this in the near future, but this may not get put out till after. I'm doing um, Addictions here, October 25th, 26th. It's Addictions and EFT and Attachment, um, big love and specialty of mine. I'm going to Portsmouth in April to do um, Walking Through Shame. Uh, I was one of the co-creators of the first shame workshop and I've been doing studying shame, working with shame, recovering from toxic shame myself for 32 years now. And then last few years, um, Cindy Wander, who's here in Denver and I did a intensive sort of review of shame literature. So it's a very up to date with video clips that's in Portsmouth. Um, I'm going to be in Merida, Merida, de Mexico next a year ago in November doing addiction wow. and stage two. Um, try, oh, and I have an externship here in May of 2020 um, that you can find at the Colorado Center site, um, coloradoeft.com or at jimthomas.care. And if you're a couple or family or a therapist looking for some place where people can come and do two or three days of really intense, um, tightly woven, emotionally focused therapy or emotionally focused family therapy, individual therapy, um, you can find out more about that at uh, the doc care um, backslash intensives at Jim Thomas doc care. Okay. I think that's probably. Yeah. And we're going to talk about all this stuff that we can do with this model. Yeah. And I'm going to put links to all of your websites on the description okay. of the video guys. So just make sure that you scroll down in the description on YouTube and you'll be able to see links to Jim's websites and stay tuned for upcoming trainings. And you're welcome to contact Jim and ask him to come do a training in your area. It's always an option. So talk to hey, him. There's a lot more of these discussions with like the one with Catherine Reem is just really powerful. And there's, there's a, um, 
a lot more of these um, where you found this one. So there's, awesome. there's are great little pep talks. I go and listen to my colleagues when I'm <laughs> wondering why I'm not like a, you know, a greeter at like Costco or Walmart. <laughs> why well, do all this? You know, <laughs> it's so stressful sometimes. We need booster shots, all of us. Right. Uh, and that's so validating to hear that even you as an expert, as a trainer. Uh, what are we at? I just love being with people and I'm, a, I'm attached to human connection and fostering that and helping find people that are lost and distant from each other and EFT. And so, yeah, we got we to gotta fill each other up. It's tough work. It's hard work out there, folks. Thanks for all you're doing on the front lines. And to all you people new to EFT, attachment-based work, emotionally focused, like vulnerable work, hang in there because it, it stirs us up too. It's a human experience and how could it not be? Yeah. Thank you so much for filling us up with our daily dose of EFT today, Jim. And we'll get this out, guys. Just make sure that you like and follow Jim and that you look for our supervision group and trainings and make sure that you hit subscribe because more EFT videos are on the way. Mm.